program manager, chairman, whatever we want to call it, uh, Kevin, um, K4 GTR, I learned something earlier in reading the, the bio, the biopsy, yeah, the bio, <laughs> uh, Kevin has been licensed since about the mid-70s, 1975, he was a novice, and his original call was WN for BNU, and then he upgraded to advanced in uh, 76 and was issued a call WB for BMU. So then, then when the, the vanity calls became available, he uh, he changed to his current call W4 GTR. So that's that's explained, well, became an extra class. So that's explained in, in, uh, in just a minute. He, he's got a BSEE in electrical engineering from the University of Florida. Florida. GTR Gator, right? Yeah. Okay, that explains the call now. So this thing's beeping at me, so I'm going to move. Uh, I don't know if it's a Windows update or what, but uh, so his his uh, he was also the uh, president of their uh, Gator Amateur Radio Club, GARC, and uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. And uh, he was responsible for resurrecting one of their repeaters down there. Uh, his career, his uh, at work career has been including Motorola, Panasonic, several other smaller RF technical companies. Uh, currently, he's in a ma he's a manufacturing engineer with ComScope and uh, specializing in Wi-Fi and other related RF technologies. Let me know if you need any help on this uh, Wi-Fi presentation. No, <laughs> he's, no he, he ain't gonna need it. Uh, his main interests are amateur radio, UHF, VHF. Uh, Propagation and mountain topping. You climb summits. Yeah. Climb summits. Six meters, 160 meters. Uh, rack chewing, antenna design, and installation, and just general operations. So, uh, without further ado, for Wi-Fi for hams, please welcome Kevin. Thank you very much, Joe. So Wi-Fi. Can I go? Um, one of the things I want to bring up about this. I'm sure there's some people out there who are Wi-Fi experts. Any hands out there? People really have worked with it pretty well? All right. Well, I, really, I brought this up as far as Wi-Fi for hands because I wanted to kind of take Wi-Fi, which to many people is like black magic, and put it in terms that a lot of ham radio operators deal with. I mean, it is a microwave. They operate in microwave bands, in which many hams operate in microwave bands. And not only that, propagation, very similar to what we experience at UHF, a little bit worse as you get up into the higher frequencies, but there's a lot of similarities between what's done in Wi-Fi, and I'm not gonna go into the, all the software and everything else that goes on to it, but I am gonna touch on some things to give you some ideas of some of the modulation. And I see what you mean about the beeping. That was me, sorry, I'm muting. The timer is done, that's what this is. Just close my lid, Kevin. Oh, just close it, okay. I don't know how to stop it. Nope. Is it me leaving? No, it's it's a timer. That's, let me just go ahead and dismiss it. Otherwise, I'll hear that the whole time. And yay! All right. So anyway, I won't hear that thing. You may not hear it back there, but I can certainly hear it here. Well, good. Can you hear me okay? Throughout. Okay. Excellent. I want to make sure I'm talking loud enough. So as far as the history of Wi-Fi, I used to think for years that it meant for wireless fidelity which is really another term for that could be this is making a cell phone call to your spouse versus wireless infidelity so you don't want anything like that <laughs> i know bad joke but anyway the person who invented it, coined the term wi-fi if you remember back in the hi-fi days high fidelity stereo systems it was kind of a pun on that and that's something i learned today as i was doing some of my research because i was originally said yeah it came from wireless fidelity it was short for that but it really isn't so but wi-fi had its early roots actually with a joint venture with AT&T and NCR to wirelessly link cash registers to be able to exchange information. Eventually the IEEE got together and they created uh, specifications to go ahead and use initially the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, which I'll go and show you a little bit later. 
That band also is a ham radio band. In fact, there's some ham radio operators that have used some of the Wi-Fi frequencies, done mountaintop to mountaintop, 30 mile range and stuff like that. But you can do that with amateur radio. You can't do that with Wi-Fi. And if you get a Wi-Fi box and say, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and operate this as a ham radio unit, it's gonna be really tough because the people who develop these products, they have encrypted software that just, you're not supposed to be able to hack it. Because one thing that the SEC really frowns on is you, you're, if this is a non, an unlicensed operation, you don't have to have a license for Wi-Fi. Amateur radio you do, especially if you're gonna kick power up above the uh, four watts that you would end up having. So if you're gonna run a lot more power, you would have to have a license. You gotta be able to go in and break it and change it around. And like I said, the FCC would really frown if you're not a ham radio operator and you're putting on 100 watts. And at 2.4 gigahertz, really don't want to do that because there was an IOT product that I did, Internet of Things. It was a module that was another company that I worked over in Smyrna. And we were doing some testing of this particular module and hooked it up to an antenna. And the thing would put out about 23 dBm. So this is about, I don't know, it was a little over 100 milliwatts, 200 milliwatts of power. I had my hand near the antenna and it was getting warm. My hand was. So, I mean, microwave ovens operate at 2.5 gigahertz, 2,500 megahertz. So you can understand why the water molecules in your hand are warming up. So after that, I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that. So the higher power, you really don't want to mess with. It can really tear you up. So IEEE came up with this, and you'll see 802.11, A, B, G, all these different variants. Those are just specifications that the IEEE set up. But the general user out there, you're going like 802. Dot what? And you're seeing B and G, I mean they marketed that. Eventually, recently, the Wi-Fi Alliance came up with nomenclature for the later versions of Wi-Fi, like Wi-Fi N, Wi-Fi AC, Wi-Fi AX, which is the latest one. They started calling it Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6. They never really went back to the original Wi-Fi, which was B, to call that Wi-Fi 1, but that's essentially where they started from. So, and I'll explain all the different Wi-Fi's, all the different variations, what they've done. The key thing about Wi-Fi, as you get newer and newer Wi-Fi technologies, the throughput speed gets faster and faster and faster and faster. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead on this particular one now. I will be jumping ahead if I mention this, but the Wi-Fi Alliance, they're the ones who end up using, if you see a product that you buy, it should have this Wi-Fi certified. That means they've tested it to make sure that it meets the specifications for 802.11, it also meets the specifications in the U.S., meaning FCC specifications that it doesn't exceed certain uh, bandwidth requirements, power requirements, it doesn't cause interference, and all that other kind of stuff. So this proves that this is a good device. It also shows you have interoperability. If your iPhone and your Android phone and all these other phones, your laptops, if, uh, if they weren't Wi-Fi certified, they're not guaranteed to operate with these different devices. So this whole operation of validation of the actual product allows you to be able to seamlessly work across party lines, essentially. So you want to make sure any box, and if you go to any Amazon or Walmart or Micro Center, any of the, the Wi-Fi box they have here, they all are going to be Wi-Fi certified. So it's very rare that you're going to find something, unless maybe if you go to Alibaba, you might find something that isn't certified, and you may be illegal for that. It may operate out of band, it may do some other different things that uh, you shouldn't really do. Brody and Schwartz had this presentation that they did, give them credit for this one. And at the very end of my presentation, you'll see a bunch of hyperlinks. So you can click a lot of these different things that are available. But I thought this was a great view, and I've actually taken different of these screenshots to hone in because you can't see this from your distance there. But this blue line that you see going here, this is basically the mainstream of Wi-Fi that is the consumer type of Wi-Fi device. You have some other different Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi for automotive. Uh, this one here, 802.11ab, that operates at 60 gigahertz for very high speed, very, very short range. The 60 gigahertz happens to be the uh, natural resonant frequency, the oxygen molecule. So as you can see, it doesn't go very far maybe 10 meters and it doesn't go through walls much at all. So there's just different types of Wi-Fi they've come up with. It's not just 
uh, the main stuff that we're dealing with. But what we have here, you started off with B, then went to A. I guess they were working on A and had to get that going on the wide and backwards, what it was. But A happens to be your 5 gigahertz band. B, which is 2.4 gigahertz band, was more readily available. And the ISM band, and I'll go through some of the acronyms a little bit too, that's industrial, scientific, and medical. It's a license-free band. It also has to encroach on an amateur radio band. So they kind of, there's so much crowded traffic on that band now that it's really useless for amateur radio units. But those are the different uh, iterations and everything gets faster and faster and faster. And I'll be going over some of this stuff here as far as the future of Wi-Fi and why you'd be interested in this. So one of the things that they've done with Wi-Fi to help increase the speed is have what they call spatial streams. Now we all know when we get on two meters, you go to talk, say you're on simplex 146.52, and you're vertically polarized. The HF contest comes around. If somebody else is horizontally polarized, you're going to get at least 20 dB of attenuation just because of the cross-polarization of that. Well, what they've done with Wi-Fi is they're using not only polarization changes, but also antenna diversity, because the wavelengths of these are very, very small. I mean, 2.4 gigahertz, your wavelength is like this. 5 gigahertz, your wavelength is really, really small. So it doesn't take much to get what we call spatial diversity. So you'll have now, instead of just a single port like you used to have, now you'll have, in your phone itself, you may have multiple streams. If you look at the specifications, it'll say 2x2 two two or 3x3, three three, or your laptop especially, 2.4 gig, maybe 2x2, two 5 gig, 3x3. Three three. It means you're capable of doing three consecutive or concurrent streams of data that it picks up from this. And that's, they're having parallel channels on the same frequency, but in different polarizations. And orthogonal is another one, like I said, spatial. You can have an antenna here versus an antenna here and it'll show up in a different phase and therefore it will add properly. And that's a cheap way of getting more throughput rather than having, like Ethernet for instance, you have three different pairs in those lines. You get high speed from combining those pairs together. That's the way they've done this with RF, is not only bandwidth, but also the number of streams. You'll see a lot with the Wi-Fi, and I'll go briefly over this. I'm not gonna go uh, in depth here, but I've got some other slides that actually show more what MCS stands for. And it's basically, you have different different modes, like if you take a look at PSK31, I mean that's 31, you know, I think a half or a quarter bits per second, it's really slow speed, but it actually punches through. It's a very good weak signal. If you want to go higher data rates, the problem is with that, it's more prone to errors and things like that. You'll get more throughput, but you're more prone to errors. And MCS levels are basically defining the type of bandwidth, the type of speed, the number of streams. So when you're real close to your Wi-Fi router, I mean, you've got full connectivity, there's very little errors, uh, what we call EVM or error vector magnitude on the transmission side, or BER, or bit error rate on the receive side, but errors are bad. And there's something called ACK and NAC, for those of you who are familiar with the RS-232 platform. So if you send data and it comes back and says data's perfect, fine, you send the next group of packets. Whereas if you did some bad data and it shows that this is not good, it'll ask you to reset. So that's it's the same thing with Wi-Fi. So if you go to Packet Radio, it's all, and uh, it's a RS-232 and all these different protocols we've been using for years in amateur radio, it ties very nicely in here. Those things are proven out. And there are packets of data that are sent with Wi-Fi. It packetizes all that. So it's not like a, an analog audio stream like you're listening to your favorite FM radio station it's actual packets of data, whether you convert that into video or uh, audio or anything else, data for that matter. RSSI is something that's very important with Wi-Fi for throughput. If it turns out your signal, receive signal strength indicator, just like your S units here at S9, you can turn down your RF gain and the armchair copy. But when your RSSI it drops down, you're at it, listening to an S2. And if you've ever done any like Ole Miss net or any of these other type of worked all stakes net, you'll hear you know, oh, you're five by five, whatever. Or if you're two by two, rifle shot, rifle shot, bang, bang, you know, and just all these different things they'll do. It's the same thing here with uh, the RSSI. If the signal strength is really low, what it'll do is drop down to a slower bit rate to punch it through, just like FT8. You know, really, it's a, a JT65 and these other little modes 
that slows the data down and it is able to get things through. And Wi-Fi does the same kind of thing. It's always looking at the signal strength to make sure that you're getting a good signal noise ratio of your signal. And if it's not good enough, it'll drop down the rate until you finally you're just out of range. If it's too far, you're just not going to be able to do it. But those are very important things to Wi-Fi. There's different modulation types that they use as well. I'm not going to go into great details with some of these other ones like CCK. Those are done with Wi-Fi B and G. And then they started, uh, they had direct sequence spread spectrum in the very beginning, frequency hopping. Uh, but then binary phase shifting, you should be all familiar with that. That's BSK31. And then they end up adding some other higher speed. And I'll go into QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. OFDM and OFDMA is the latest one that gives you really high speed. And it's just very efficient use of spectrum. It's like I gave in a presentation with television a while back. You've got a 6 megahertz TV channel. When you were analog, it was 6 megahertz. With digital, it's still 6 megahertz. But they found ways to cram more information. And now with the new ATSC 3.0, they have some other new modulation techniques that allow them to cram even more data in that same bandwidth. And that's what they're doing here with Wi-Fi as well. So the different modulation schemes can be more efficient. They're becoming more critical because errors, you don't have as much room for wiggle room as far as errors. Like you're in a crowded room and you can barely move around. And that's as much room as you can do. And then you're out of error. And you'll see a, a full slide that I found from I think it was Rodian Schwartz that had this as well. And it's a really good graphical display that shows you the importance of your, what we call EDM, or error vector magnitude, or transmission system, and how the errors will affect uh, your data. Am I losing everybody so far? Are you all kind of, are you losing? <laughs> all right, I'm trying to keep it down. If you have any questions, by all means, stop. You need to repeat on anything. Uh, anytime you want, just raise your hand. You talked about the polarization. Yes. But, but like, does the polarization of my phone change? Is, is it does. It, it does. does. Well, but your phone, you'll probably have two different antennas at least, one horizontal, one vertical. In fact, if you go to a cellular site, it used to be they had vertical and horizontal antennas on their arrays up in cell phone tower. Now they do their 45 degree angles. So each of the transmit antennas, they're transmitting on both antennas active at the same time and that way because nobody's ever sitting there with their like with a handheld you will you make sure your handheld vertical you're not going to do this with your handheld you're going to be this with a cell phone you don't really know what your polarization is so they've taken care of that with the cellular antennas at the base stations the cell towers if it's got both horizontal and vertical components as one antenna well it doesn't really matter where you are it's going to pick up both and that's the same thing with Wi-Fi here it may end up switching, you have where one antenna would be to stream one, another antenna would be stream two. When you flip your phone, it just swaps over and now it becomes stream two versus stream one. But they just swap back and forth. But you're always going to have too close to yes. yeah. Any other questions? All right. Some other acronyms in the industry, you're going to hear AP. Well, this is nothing more than your wireless router. AP is an access point. It just Here's a point, you'll see, uh, go to any office complex, you'll see these antennas in the ceiling. Those are access points. And that basically allows your phone or your laptop to have access to the internet through that access point, that router. And each of those routers are then connected through wires, ethernet, that end up going to a main server somewhere. And that's for an enterprise system. Enterprise being like for a football stadium, baseball stadium, or an office complex. Those aren't just like what's in your home. What I'm talking to you about is more what's in your home. But regardless, they're still called access points. All these other different things, you can look at them later, but SISO, single input, single output, that's just very simple. Your phone to your router, and that's it. With the more complex, like Wi-Fi 6 that you have now, those will allow multiple users to hook up and have great throughput, and they don't affect each other. Whereas in the olden days, what would happen you would end up sharing data. Now it shares time between you and somebody else. So if you go to a gas station, you're pumping gas. Somebody pulls up on the gas pump just on the other side, and you're pumping along, and it's going fine, and they start pumping gas, and all of a sudden, you know, the flow goes down because they're sharing the same common pump. It always happens. That's the way the older systems work. 
Now with the newer technology from Wi-Fi, they've gotten a whole lot better where they've designed them to work around multiple users. So that's where this MIMO comes in, multiple in, multiple out. Um, they break them up in what's called resource units. DFS is something real interesting that I'll show you later on with five gigahertz. Doesn't make sense now, but it will make sense later. It's basically a listen before transmit. And I've got a lot of, I've got several different Wi-Fi routers that if you go into the menu and try to program the channels, there's a group of channels like, hey, wow, five gigahertz, it's this huge band, it's got all these channels. But it really doesn't. There's a lot of channels that are shared by radar. It's not primary for Wi-Fi routers. They're shared by radar, whether from airplanes or ground-based radar. And if you, uh, if there's a radar in your area, you can't use those channels. So it's supposed to listen, and if it turns out those channels are in use by radar, you're out of it. And my routers, I don't even have a menu. I can even go in there and try to enforce those channels. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, you only get a microphone. Another, we have another wireless? No. Could, oh. you, could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'll repeat Because the there. microphone and, is and here. stay in the middle. I'll stay in the middle. <laughs> so in your home, you have a choice between 2.4 and 5 gig. Right. Your router. So uh, they say that it's best to use uh, the Wi-Fi network that you have the best so you should be, as far as it'll recommend, you can use a device for 2.4 gig or for 5 gig. Go ahead. Okay, so, as far as you're concerned, which one is the best um, when it comes to, say, using a phone versus, say, your phone? I'll go into that in a lot more detail, but short answer, 5 gig. But there are times when 2.4 gig is better for you. It depends on what you're trying to do. It has to do with range, it has to do with speed, and congestion. But if you can get on 5 gig and you've got a good connection, go that all the way. So just to repeat the whole idea, if you've got a device that, and there's some devices that only work on 2.4 gig because they're old, and they don't have 5 gig in there. My wife had a laptop that we were scratching our heads why she was still buffering. Go like, I put a new router up here, it's, you know, I'm getting a 220 megabit per second on 5 gig. And it turns out that her card only had 2.4 gig and only handled 20 megahertz channels. So I was like, Ugh. it was struggling. It's like, you've got a six inch water pipe that can just flow all sorts of water and you're pumping it into a half inch pipe. And that's what you're dealing with there. So think of that as pipe. Plumbing is always a good analogy for throughput and stuff like that. Answer your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent. So as far as throughput speeds, and this really falls right into what you're talking about here, the key thing that people look at like, oh wow, this Wi-Fi router, it'll do 10 gigabit per second, yay! Well, what's coming in your house is only capable of doing 25 megabit per second with the internet. So within your house, yeah, you could transfer you know, high speed between devices that are all connected to that network, but if all you're doing is surfing the internet, and want to connect and download your emails, you are, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, dependent. You're dependent on what's coming into the house. I've got AT&T DSL, it's 25 megabit per second. I've got Spectrum, because I had to get it for my kids, because they were you know, sucking all the life out of it. 25, my wife's trying to watch ESPN, some streaming game. So I ended up getting Spectrum as well. But Spectrum wasn't always reliable, so I've kept both AT&T and Spectrum. And sure enough, they were putting AT&T fiber in my neighborhood. And lo and behold, they cut some cables. And it turns out the cable they cut was my Spectrum cable. And it was on tax day. Fortunately, they didn't cut my AT&T cable. So I just whoop, switched over AT&T, sent my tax forms off, and I was good. So that can happen. Now, once AT&T fiber is activated, I'm going over that, killing you know, the AT&T uh, DSL and killing Spectrum, you just have it one. And then I'll have one gigabit per second coming into my house. And that's downstream. And it's not always upstream. You'll find, oh, I've got all this great downstream. I can, you know, do 220 megabit per second downstream. And upstream, you're 10 megabit per second, which is okay for most parts. But 
for some time it's not enough, yes. So I have at and fiber to the house. It's symmetric gigabit. It is symmetric. Up and Symm down. Symmetric one gigabit. Excellent. Yep. I mean, there's some that aren't, that you actually have to pay to get that. They'll, they'll throttle you back on the upstream because they'll advertise you know, this great downstream. So I'm glad <coughs> and I'm looking forward to finally yeah, turning on at and I've already paid for it ahead of time whenever they're doing the final stuff, fibers in the ground, ready to go. They're just not going around the people's houses yet, but um, shortly. So that's the key thing. What's coming in your house is going to be your fundamental. The other thing, too, is the device you have. If you have an iPhone 4, instead of the latest iPhone, I mean, you're going to have something that is probably only has 2.4 gigahertz in there, probably only 20 megahertz channels, and we know the wider the bandwidth, the more data speed that you get. It's like with an amateur radio. When you're talking CW, you can get a certain amount of speed. As you go into you know, wider bandwidths, a packet, for instance, take a look at some of the packets that's out there, you get much faster speed when you go to wider bandwidths. It's just the way it works. So, what was I mentioning about this? Oh yeah, your devices. So to make sure that your limiting factors are not just what's coming in your house, but also your devices themselves. Take a look at those. If it turns out you got slow speed, like my wife's laptop, go ahead and get a new card. For like 15 bucks, you got a new card, swap it out, plug it in, now she's happy. She's got great speed, operates with 5 gig, and it was, I don't know why, it was an HP laptop, it wasn't that old, but it had an old card in there. So you gotta take a look at what you have to make sure you have the capability. If you can get on a higher bandwidth channel, obviously that's going to be better if you can get on 5 gigahertz, because, and I'll, the 2.4 gig, you'll see some interesting stuff there, besides being a crowded band. Uh, but if you can get on a 40 or an 80 megahertz channel on 5 gig, you have so much more throughput. And these, what we call MCS tables, you'll see the actual theoretical speeds you can get per stream, you know, on the 80 megahertz channel. And then there's even some that are 160 megahertz channels. Not too many APs actually work on those particular carriers to get that kind of wide bandwidth. Most of the ones you get out there are 20, 40, 80. They don't allow 160. Yeah, there are some chipsets that do 160. And if you can get one of those, then you're going to have even faster throughput. But it turns out your phone needs to also be able to handle 160 at the same time. Otherwise, it's going to throttle back to whatever it can do. Yes, Dave? I, I don't know if you covered this already, but uh, with Wi Fi, I thought I had a big mouth. With Wi-Fi, can you do channel bonding like you can with... Okay, go ahead. The channel bonding is where you... Those are the newer devices, and that's where you'll see it'll have like 80 plus 80. So 80 megahertz, here's an 80 megahertz channel, they'll bond it to another 80 megahertz channel, and basically go pseudo 160 megahertz channel on two different channels. But not consecutive channels, they may be over here and over there. So that's how they end up doing that. The 100 and jumping ahead, we'll get on the okay. but yeah, channel bonding is something they end up doing. The distance from your Wi-Fi router too, is you're real close and you've got really good signal strength RSSIs up there, the EVM, because you can run lower power, you've got a good connection from your AP to your phone to your laptop, I mean it hums along, you get great speeds, but the further away you get, not only do you get latency or delays in time, but you also have to crank your power transmitter power up to reach the two, and then you start getting what we call EVM. So you get more errors in the system, and eventually the errors get so large it has to cut down to a lower speed, and then a lower speed, and a lower speed, in order to still maintain that connection. So distance from your router is real important. Right. So they using any type of forward error correction? Um, I believe so. I'm not getting into that detail. I have to really look at. I believe there is obviously some. I know it definitely, with, the question was, is there any forward error correction being done? And I'm pretty sure there is because I know that if the, uh, like the app and that, if it turns out the signal, the packet has too many errors in it, we'll ask, ask, ask to repeat that again. Now whether it actually there's a forward error and, and buffers that, I'm not 100% sure, but I know there is something to make sure your data is good. Okay. I should know. Because I yeah, I haven't I dug into that one. Now. I know they have all sorts of different error correction, whether it's forward error correction, I don't know, but there's, I mean, the software folks, they get all sorts of stuff going on there. 
So looking at the actual allocations, you got 2.4 gigahertz. This is an FCC. You can get this on the, the internet, and I've got a link to this as well. And it's got all sorts of different frequencies. But you'll see amateur radio right in here, 2.4 to 2.4, 2.45. This is all amateur radio, but this is also the ISM band from 2450 plus or minus 50. So all of this has been turned into Wi-Fi. And then Wi-Fi 5 gig, you're going to see different sections in here. This has all been reallocated. Although some of these are still in use, and the Wi-Fi is on a secondary basis, and that's where you'll see some radar meteor meteorological aids. But there's one spot in there that there's a nice little blank spot, and that's because of the 5.8 gig amateur band, and you'll see amateur satellites. So there's a little section in here, there are no Wi-Fi channels, and that's because a amateur radio has a primary allocation. Yay. So we haven't lost that yet. And then going up to the new 6 gigahertz band, which we'll talk about a little bit later, there's a whole bunch of people that are being asked to move. And that's um, Yep. But there's also an ISM band there at 5.8 gig. So 2.4 gigahertz channels. You'll see where, oh, I've got a 20, and I've got a 40 gig, uh, megahertz channel bandwidth option. Well. There may be 13 channels, but they're not 13 individual channels that you could operate at the same time without interfering to each other. They overlap. If you really want to look at 2.4 gig, you've really only got three channels that you can operate without interference. So people usually go 1, 6, and 11. And if you go to Walmart, oh, 1, 6, and 13. Uh, 11. 11, yeah, you're right, 13, not 13. Um, I was in Walmart and I looked at, I've got a special app I'll show you later that I looked at my phone, and they have everything all lined up on 2.4 gigs, so it's all these different, uh, just those three channels that they have lined up inside there. Where you get in your neighborhood and you take a look, and all your neighbors are on channel two, channel five, and all sorts of other stuff. I mean, it's just a, a mishmash, it's all really crowded and nasty. But not only do you have this issue of overlapping channels, you've got other things on 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah, there we go. So it's very crowded. Not only do you have Wi-Fi, you've also got Internet of Things, or Zigbee. So your Samsung refrigerator has this little IoT device in there. It's operating on one of these channels that happens to fall right on one of the Wi-Fi channels. And then you got Bluetooth. If you got the legacy Bluetooth or classic Bluetooth, there's 80 different little 1 megahertz channels all scattered in there. Bluetooth Low Energy has done the 2 megahertz channels, and it's uh, 40 of those. So you've got everybody in the imaginable using all these different frequencies. It's a very crowded and noisy band. Oh, and microwave ovens operate there. Fortunately, you've got good shielding, so they're pretty much self-contained, but if you've got a leaky oven, it'll kind of also you, interfere. You have other problems. You've got other problems as well. <laughs> now, gee, why am I getting sunburn from hanging in front of it? That would not be a good thing. So the current 5 gigahertz channels, as I was mentioning, you've got DFS channels. SC's channel is in here. So there's a whole bunch of them you can't even use. You can't use these channels here if it's weather radar. So most of the time, most of your APs, you're going to find you've got these channels here. So you've got, you don't have any 160 megahertz channels. You've got 180 megahertz channel, or 240, or 420 megahertz channels. Same thing up here at this end up here. You've got these 5 20 megahertz channels, 240, 180 megahertz channel. So it's, you do have a lot more bandwidth than on 2.4 gig, but for instance, my wife has this, uh, it's a device to connect wirelessly for 5.8 gig from a cable box in the family room to the bedroom so she can use that because we don't have a whole house DVR, charter spectrum doesn't operate that. So they're antiquated in their design of their systems. So the way we end up doing it, we transmit at 5.8 gigs. So channel 149 is being used for that. Well, when I first set up the AP, I put it on an 80 megahertz channel, and it was interfering with this. So she was going, it's cut in and out whenever I'm streaming and stuff. Uh, that's why. So I had to go through and change it over to a 40 megahertz channel to cure the problem altogether. So you can look at, when you look at your app, that you can download. iPhone's got them, Android's got them, they're free. At least I know for Android it's free. Apple, yeah, I think you have to pay for everything all the time. But you might get some free apps. 
but it's great. You go to your friend's house and they're saying they got Wi-Fi problems. Go take a look. It may be that they've got all their APs on one channel and they're interfering like crazy with each other. And we know about interference. Look at the contest or whatever. It's like, get off my frequency. Or you're on FT8 and somebody's keying up and having a sideband conversation. Or I'm sorry, a CW conversation or something else right in the middle of FT8 and they're just messing up. So we know about interference. You've got to watch out about that. So for the definitions of uh, some of the earlier ones, 802.11b, A, and G. So there's all these different types of modulation schemes, and it shows, in this case, they don't really show the upper speed. There's some other ones that show the upper speed. But the type of modulations that they use, and this one has the 64 qualm, and depending on the channel bandwidth. But these were only 20 megahertz channels at that particular time. As you migrated up to newer ones, oh, and just uh, this is a comparison. Take a look at some of the modulation schemes. For FT8, it's a um, square wave. Yeah, it is a square wave, but I'm trying to think as far as it, for the different uh, characters, you, know, you can hear it audio-wise. I was trying to get something that would show more of a digital constellation. It doesn't really have that, so it's the closest thing I could get. For BPSK modulation for PSK31, you have a longer, it's almost like Morse code in this case, longer versus shorter, whether you have a one or a zero. With uh, some of these earlier modulations, the CCK, they had some stuff here that was at different angles, so they really look at phase a lot. And that's phase, not phase. So they had set this up wrong, but you'll see there's different, in this case, they all have one amplitude, but it has different phases depending on what's going on. It's very slow, but it's what they initially started with. <coughs> Then you get into QAM, and here you have different coordinates. So each of these little dots here represents a coordinate, represents a data point. So if you go back to your Boolean algebra, ooh, I hated that class. But still, you take a look at QPSK, it's just a variation of that, and you just add more and more of these bits. So it goes from two digits, this will have three, and then four. So you see here, those all the coordinates, and those actually tell you what the amplitude is, depending how far it is phase angle from zero degrees, and that'll end up providing you with that particular data. So all that data gets, it's still in the same uh, 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz channel, but just a way to pack more data. That's what they're doing with all these different protocols. Then we get up into some of the other ones where you get a whole lot more, and this is a really cool graph. It shows you the four qualms, 16, 32, 64, all the way up to 256, so there's a whole lot more data still being crammed in the same uh, channel bandwidth, and if you go back to your earlier days, I mean earlier days of dial-up, if you remember the 1200 kilobaud modem, and eventually we got the 56k, and if you heard it, there was just different kind of noises. They were doing the same kind of thing, where they were just adding more and more data characters to get more throughput through the same 3 kilohertz phone line. So with Wi-Fi 5, and that's what this stands for, this is Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6, they're going to 256 all the way up to 1024 qualm. So they're just packing a whole lot more data in the same channel. So 802.11n, this came out several years ago, and I've got, no, I don't have this, I think I took this one offline. But this is the first time they started allowing multiple streams. But still, the maximum bandwidth is only 40 megahertz. But it was a start. Uh, it was both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So, and that was really a, a big thing to help increase the speed. So when we get up to now, if you compare N, AC, and AX, which is the latest commercial option, you see all the different changes. You went from 20 and 40 megahertz bandwidth, and here you go, Dave, there's your 80 plus 80. So they've got all these different bandwidths they've increased to give you a lot more speed, different modulations, different subcarrier spacing, I mean, all these different things, different streams. They went from 8 by 8, and then you, here's your theoretical max data rate, 540 megabits per second. To almost 7 gig per second to almost 10 gig per second. So, I mean, the whole idea is more speed, more speed, more speed. Still, you got to make sure what's coming in your house has decent speed. But at least if you have an internal network, you have a server that you've downloaded your Netflix onto, and you're watching on this big screen TV, you know, without interruption through Wi Fi, you can do that with these you know, newer Wi Fi technologies, not the older ones. Quick question. Yes. 
shows how little I'm following, but what's the difference between 80 plus 80 versus 160 as far as throughput? Okay, let me go back over here to the 80 plus 80 would be able to take maybe this channel and this channel and put them together. Okay. Whereas 160 is putting this channel and this channel together at 160. Is the throughput similar? Yes. Okay. It's similar, but not quite. 160 megahertz channel doesn't. There's guard bands and other stuff that are in there that you lose a little bit, but they're very similar okay. in speed. Certainly a lot better than just 80. You almost double the speed. Certainly when you go from 80 to 160, you double the speed. Well, that, was, that was my question, is whether or not 80 plus 80 is effectively the same as 160. And it's why close. Why would you want one over the other? It's close. It's just that for uh, 160, you really don't... Well, for instance, your, uh, some of your devices just won't operate 160 in here. In order to get 160, you have to have clear channels, the DFS. Unless you have a DFS channel that's clear here, you can't, all four of these have to be clear. So you can't have a 160 megahertz channel. But you could do 80 fifth 80 if you could yes. one side the other. Okay. This one right. and this one are clear. So you can do that. In Atlanta, would the DFS channels typically be clear? Not, I've not gotten mine to be clear. Okay. Now, it could be my devices just don't listen, but I've not been able to hang the menu. It's grayed out, so it doesn't even allow me to go there. Okay. Now, you may have a newer device that does, but so far I've got an Asus, and I've got a Linksys. I've got a few different ones, and they don't allow me to do that. Okay. Any other questions? We won't get into this. This is, like I said, much more detailed. This is if you want to look at it for reference. OFDM, that's what's used on a lot of the later ones. And it's a, a lot higher speed. You have a bunch of different little subcarriers that allow you to be able to pack more data in there. But this is the newest one, AX. They have what's called OFDMA, orthogonal frequency division multiple access. And what that allows you to do, here's, Steve, this is, uh, this is you. Steve, this is you. And then Dallas, this is you. So all these different, they break up the different channels into smaller, what they call resource units. So you can all operate on that same Wi-Fi router or AP at the same time with a lot more priority to use the OGY. So then you end up scattering these hog. throughout. I'm a hog. Yeah, so you're a data hog. And so the data hog gets a whole lot more of its time, and they shuffle it around, and they pack it in here, such that it's really more efficient use of the spectrum. There's no dead time. It's all this data that's packed in there, so it allows you to be able to pack a lot more users, get more speed, and just, it's better utilization. So that's the thing that 802.11 AX, and if you see a lot of those, it'll also say Wi-Fi 6 on the box. You typically don't see AX so much. The marketing has taken over, so you can see Wi-Fi 6. So the MCS tables, I mentioned earlier about the different polarizations, and if you know, in fact, going over your satellite, if you remember TDRO, you've got, I believe, 22 satellite channels? 24. 24, okay, it's been a long time, but it's 24 channels, but they're able to double that by, here's the antenna, the actual driven element in the antenna oh, feed horn. 12 and 12. Oh, 12 and 12, okay, thank you. Like it's been a long time. So you have this, and then when you flip over to an odd channel, whoop, the antenna would flip over, and because of that polarization change, there was enough isolation, you could get other data channels. So you had uh, HBO East, flip it over here, HBO West, or whatever, from the Galaxy uh, geosynchronous satellite up there. They do the same thing here with polarization. You get a lot of attenuation of the signal depending on the polarization. If you have a good antenna, 30 dB. Yeah, in free space, yeah. So this is a really big MCS table, and this is basically going through a bunch of different streams. So I zoomed in on this one, and you can take a look just for three streams. So it shows the different streams, the different types of modulation that are used with these different, what they call indexes. That's just a reference. But it shows all the different coding. And here's the thing that you're, you care about, is what kind of speed do I get for an 80 megahertz channel with, this is a guard interval, it's just a delay time, the space you put in between there. So you can get, Basically, 1.8 gigabits per second. Of okay, speed. The code is probably the FEC code. Probably. Um, 
I'm not a big code expert on that one, so I'm that hard to decide. But for 160 megahertz, you can see you're doubling. You get 3.6 gigabits per second with just three streams. So that really makes a big difference. And then when you get up to eight streams, almost 10 gig throughput. So that's the whole idea. The more streams, more parallel paths. This is like a super highway. I, I hate to equate it to 85, but if you remember 85 only had two lanes of traffic in each direction, you can only get so much traffic. But it's, theoretically, as you expand where it's now four lanes on each side, hey, you should be able to get more through, we get more traffic through. And as you get more and more lanes, you get more and more traffic through. And that's essentially what you're doing here. Not accounting for accidents and stuff like that, which would be where you uh, get data smashes into each other, then it tends to slow the traffic down a little bit. But it's a very similar operation as far as looking at different channels versus a highway. So propagation for 2.45 and now 6 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz has the best range just because it's a lower frequency. Just like 6 meters has a better propagation range for ground wave coverage than 2 meters and especially UHF. Similar type of situation here. For 2.4 gigahertz you have better range. Problem is you mostly have just 3 20 megahertz channels got a lot of congestion so it only gets out so far because then you start getting interference from other of your neighbors who happen to be on there and other devices and whether it's IOT devices things like that the higher you go in frequency then metal objects really start affecting things you get reflections uh, if you've got metal studs in your walls versus wood that affects it uh, don't put a an AP router behind a TV not a good thing because there's all sorts of steel cage in there and it just it doesn't like it just like you don't want to have uh, any of your amateur radio equipment behind a Faraday shield essentially you want to make sure your antennas are in the clear so it's the same thing there now Wi-Fi is not as susceptible to natural noise and other types of noise interferers that we get on HF and even on low band VHF <coughs> lightning for instance as you go higher in frequency I mean a lightning storm other than getting direct hit it does you don't really hear the crackle in your radio like you do on 160 meters in the summertime. So it's really bad there. 2.4 you don't really have all that, and 5 gig you don't really have all that. It's really more attenuation. It's definitely a line of sight, it doesn't bend, and at 2.4 gigahertz you also have a lot of water absorption. And so it's just it's only meant to be a line of sight for a short distance, which is why it is what it is. So the power tables. Well, the FCC wants to make sure they're looking at ERP or EIRP. So they want to take a look at what kind of antenna gain you have. And if I want to put a 20 dB gain antenna on this particular router, I got to back my transmitter power down. They're really looking at EIRP. You are not to exceed this level, period. So depending on the antenna that you use on your device, in fact, you'll notice most of your APs that are out there, you can't change the antenna. There are a few devices where they have what they call reverse polarity SMA connectors, like your Balfung radios, some other type, it's the same type of antenna connector. You can swap them over with some other ones, but for the most part, they haven't fixed it. You can't go in and hack it and change it without damaging it. So there's all sorts of crazy formulas. If you want more details on these tables, there's a real nice set of tables on this particular website. Different antennas, some products have antennas that are all internal. Take a look at uh, Xfinity, they have their box and it's all internal antennas. And then you've got some other ones, some Asus routers and stuff like that have this whole rash of antennas on the outside. Some of those are like maybe 3 dB antennas, 5 dB antennas, some of them may even have more. This is a dual band antenna, this is dual band as well. So this is 2.4 and 5, 2.4 and 5. Coaxial light poles get a little bit better gain. But at the same time, they'll turn the transmitter power down because gain just means you still can't exceed this EIRP level. It is what it is. Just like uh, with amateur radio, you want to make sure you may have 1500 watts PEP, but you also need to make sure that you're not going to exceed a certain RF environment. Uh, what do we, I forget what that was called, the exposure thing. So you don't want to have that. Uh, this one device that I have that transmits between the family room and the bedrooms, so my wife watched up. I got one of these devices, a 10 dB 
panel antenna, and it does have that device is meant to remove the antenna, so this worked out great. So I have each of these aiming at each other, and it gets through the floors and gets through the bathroom shower and everything else, and it works fine. Yes? So being in the market for a new router, it does more antennas do anything for the actual router per se? Going back to, okay, the, the question was, going to a new router, do I need one with a lot of antennas and stuff yeah. like that? I saw on Amazon, there's one that has like 10 of them yeah. on there. Like, well, yes and no. Yes and that, they move more antennas will give you more streams, more capability, but if your phone, your laptop can't access that now or even in the future, if you go to upgrade a laptop later and you can get a Wi-Fi card that's got four streams, then you can take advantage of that. Otherwise, that's up to you. You're wasting money if you don't need all those streams. But the nice thing about the streams, too, is at least if it turns out, even if your phone or your laptop handles two streams or three streams, you'll still get a little bit better reach because maybe that this antenna is received better off of this antenna over here, so you get that spatial diversity. So it doesn't hurt, let's put it that way. It doesn't hurt to have that. Well, how many laptops and phones are on, you know, off of that router in your house? Well, that's the other thing too, how many phones and laptops are on that router. For the newer devices, if you use 11AX, it can handle multiple units, where some of the older, like N, really is one unit you're sharing time and gets kind of slow. But multiple antennas help there too. Yeah, they do. Multiple antennas will help there too. Yes. So if you have multiple units, if it's just you, yeah. but if it's multiple, it always, uh, it helps. Yes, it does. Any other questions before I move on? What did you send that port in this right here, I got that from Amazon. It was uh, like 16 bucks. It's a 10 dB panel antenna, 10 dBi on 5 gig, and it's less than that on 2.4 gig, but it works on 5 and 2.4. I'm using it for 5.8 gig, and it made a huge difference in getting a good signal between the transmitter and the receiver, because it's actually a transceiver design. The remote control actually will end up talking back through the unit down there, and there's a little IR module that plugs into it, so it is two-way. It works out well. So if you want to end up sending your signal in one particular direction, it does a great job. How tight of a bandwidth is that? It Beep. was probably about a, I'd Beep. say 20, 15 Beep. to 20 degree. Beep. Not bandwidth, it's a beam width. Beam, beam width, yes. Thank yeah, it's you. about 15 to 20 degrees. Because I took it to work, and I set on network analyzer there, and I was like, mm -hmm. and just seeing how they would go. And it was probably about a 15, maybe 20 degree bandwidth, beam width on it. So it's, it's not ultra tight, but it's uh, but enough to where better than omnidirectional. A lot better than omnidirectional. So here's a cool tool. This is one that I have on my phone. These are screenshots from my phone in my house. Remember I mentioned about that 5.8 gig router. This is what was interfering. This is my upstairs AP. This is my basement AP. So the basement doesn't really care. This doesn't care about the basement, but this is right nearby. So when I originally had this as an 80 megahertz channel, I didn't like it, it was interfering with it. So you can see that's a 20 megahertz, I'm sorry, 40 megahertz channel, and this is an 80 megahertz channel. You can see the actual channel numbers across here. This actually will go through, this is looking at the entire 5 gig band. As you can see, there's nothing in between here. None of my neighbors have it, nobody else. So DFS and Swanee, it doesn't work. 2.4 gig, now this is from my basement, so I wasn't picking up anybody else, but I bet you if I went in here, or especially if I go to anywhere else in the neighborhood, walk outside, and I've done that, I should, probably should take some shots there. I will see stuff all over the place here, especially 2.4 bigger. Yep, it's it's bad. So if you can go on 5 gig, Zach, Zach, if you can go on 5 gig, you're certainly much better off. You're more in the clear, and that graphically shows it. People are always asking, hey, i got really bad signal here, and I want to be able to put this uh, Wi-Fi extender. Wi-Fi extenders are meant for one purpose, and that is to put us in a Wi-Fi signal in an area that isn't so good from your main router. But there are some trade-offs with that. You're typically cutting your signal strength in half, oh, not signal strength, your, uh, your data throughput in half, because it's half duplex. Now, there are some newer ones that are out there that actually are using what we call a backbone frequency that may be using some of the Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, DFS channels 
as the backbone and be able to pop those, uh, that data straight through on that one, and then it'll just feed the signal right straight on through, especially if it's full duplex. So you have to look at what type. But the little cheap ones you get through Amazon or what, something that costs about 30 bucks, see it on TV right now. You can buy this for $19.95, and you get a second one absolutely free for just an extra charge. Those ones are typically operating on a 20 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz channel. That's it. So it'll get you a signal somewhere, but don't expect any great bandwidth. You're probably going to get really poor uh, throughput on that one. But it does get a signal out there. Mesh networks are also one, they uh, basically go from, like a packet network as well, go from point A to point B to point C and it relays forwards and relay, it stores and forward, stores and forward. Still it's going to be slower, but it does help to get signals in poor areas. What I did in my house, <laughs> bless you. Thank you. What I did in my house though, I've got two APs. I originally had the second AP in the attic. Don't do that because the, these APs are meant to be in air conditioned rooms and stuff like that. So they test them up to 40 degrees C. Beyond that, you're going to get degradation. Well, it gets a lot hotter than 40 degrees C in an attic. That's 104 Fahrenheit. So eventually the thing will end up croaking, which mine did. Now I ended up drilling a little small hole in the air conditioning duct and have it going right into the closet in our master bedroom closet just sitting up on a shelf. So it's up nice and high. And it's connected to the basement AP through an Ethernet cable. So I don't get any of that loss forward air correction. Yes, sir? Why don't you just run your AC ductwork? <laughs> <laughs> put, put, put the access point in your AC ductwork. Oh, yeah, right. With all that metalization? Yeah, not so good. Well, can you use the ductwork as a ground plane and put the antennas yeah. on that? Yeah. Wave guide. Uh, wave guide. Yeah, there you go. Then I have to get right in front of the AC for it to work. So the question was, for those of you online, why not just put it inside the, the AC ductwork? Yeah, I don't think that's going to do too well. So anyway, there's a nice article here from PC Magazine. If you really, it's a very practical article. You want to take a look at wireless extenders and mesh network stuff. It's a really easy read, and it tells you a whole lot of different stuff about it. So that link is in there as well. So as far as putting a Wi-Fi router in your house, if you can, put it in the most central location of your house. Obviously, for this outer range, that's going to be 2.4 gigahertz coverage. Your 5 gigahertz coverage is going to be less. So you want to make sure you're going to have the most speed where you're going to, going to need it. Say maybe your office is right here, and you've got some other places, your kid's bedroom is over here, or somebody else is there. So you want to make sure you get the most coverage there. If it turns out you can't do that, then like I said, you can do a wireless extender, or you can get some of these, like I said, the, uh, I know that my company, Comscope, makes a device, it's called a Max 31, and that particular one is a mesh network, but it uses one of the BFS channels as an actual backbone, so you don't get any loss in throughput. And that's like 500 bucks on Amazon, so they're not cheap. Any of those type of systems are a lot more expensive. But they work real well if you want to get really full coverage. Some of the other ones I've seen, you plug into the walls, you use your AC outlet. Don't, please, it's like EPL. It's gonna use your AC wires and goodbye hand bands. So you don't want to use that. Yes, sir. I'm not familiar with Xfinity offering, but the pods that they, the only one that I know of is one that my company actually makes. It connects through Ethernet. It's an 8 by 8 Wi-Fi router. I don't know of any other pods. Now, there is another company that has these little Wi-Fi you know, plug in the wall. Now, if they're using the house wiring, that's bad. If they're no, using, it's not. if it's not using the house wiring, then it's just, it's a, a Wi-Fi extender. Yeah, then it's going to end up having half the speed. But if you've got it on a 5 gig channel, then you're still going to get pretty decent speed. Oh, yeah, you don't want to use one with house wiring. It plugs in, but I don't believe it is. When we set it up in my brother's house, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a Wi-Fi setup, okay. but it integrates with their their particular system, so it's a little a little more. You got a master and slave uh, kind of it, Well, it's a little more fine-tuned because. Yeah, it's I want to say it's mesh. It's actually set up with their thing. It, it wouldn't. It's not like a third-party extender. Gotcha. Question. I, I was going to say the house wiring. Uh, what they're trying to do is. Panel, 
That's true. Sure you're on the same right. For your house wiring, just to explain you when every house wiring you got 220, but that 220 is two different 110 volt legs. And so if you end up having your Wi-Fi using your house wiring for your RF communication, it doesn't necessarily jumper from the one leg to the other leg, unless you put a capacitor online, and then you can do that RF-wise. But don't just get any other capacitor. It's got to have one that's made for that uh, with a high voltage rate. Yes, sir? Another question is, is uh, where does uh, things like security cameras, the borrow and whatnot, and their boxes? Security cameras. Security cameras, the ones that at least I've dealt with, run on 2.4 gig. They can. You know, they'll that just be another thing that'll interfere with some stuff. So you gotta watch out what they're they're on for. Now let me try to speed this up because we're running kind of late. So uh, so what's next? Wi-Fi 6E. This is the beauty. You've got a whole lot more channels. Remember those five gigahertz down here? Well now we're gonna add almost twelve hundred giga or twelve hundred megahertz of new channels. And here's where you really will have true 160 megahertz channels. So you'll be able to get some tremendous throughput on this. This will be what's called Wi-Fi 6E for extended. There's, I don't think there's any commercially available products on that. I know they're being developed right now. There may be some early stuff out there, but you'll see this in the next six months. Wi-Fi 6E products. It's $700 out of $700. Oh, seven, yeah, they're going to be expensive. Any of the few early ones that are out there. They couldn't have called it Wi-Fi 7? Well, there is Wi-Fi 7 now. There's 6E um, because they already had Wi-Fi 7. Uh, Wi-Fi 7 is still using those same 6E channels. In fact, 6E channels, there is no 20 megahertz. I think there is 20 megahertz channels. Yeah, they have 20 megahertz channels. Wi-Fi 7, though, is only going 80, 160, 320. And it's also going to 4,096 palm to give you some tremendous speeds, as much as like 40 gigabits per second. Now, vector error magnitude, just want to show you real quick. You're in a crowded room and you like your space, so picture these are all sorts of people standing in there. And if you end up, you're trying to identify, okay, I'm on this square, so I'm on 1001. Somebody else is standing over here, but if somebody moves a little bit and gets into your space, that's an error. And that's what happens. You have this, there's where you really want to be, and there's where you're actually measuring it. So you're going to have this much error in a, in a certain type of distance. So you're really, your target is here, but if your signal is actually ending up somewhere over here, that's a certain amount of error. The more you get out of that area, now you're going to have errors that you get so many of them, you're going to have to slow your speed down in order to get down. Because here, the higher speeds, this is an even smaller footprint. So you're going to have to go down to a, short, a slower speed or a slower speed. This is a real good graphic that kind of shows you, you know, speed-wise what's happening. And some of the amateur radio, protocols for packet do a similar thing, they all end up slowing down because they're getting too many errors. Now 320, there are some 320 megahertz channels with Wi-Fi 7, but once again, they're overlapping. Now Europe, they're starting to expand, but they we don't care about Europe right now because they don't, we're here in the USA, so as far as this Wi-Fi, everything's been about USA Wi-Fi. We've got definitely, you can have three 320 megahertz channels, you can these three, or these three, pick them, and you can have some tremendous bandwidth if you end up needing it. This is another really cool chart that just kind of shows you where we were with some of the older ones, and just a three-dimensional view of how much faster everything is speed-wise. Power levels as well with Wi-Fi, everything's in DBM, whereas we're used to watts. So just convert all those, but this shows the different power levels, six gigahertz, operates at slightly lower power levels, and there's some complicated formulas I'm not going to get into here. So, here's my references there. I thought I had another slide that was showing the power levels for 5 and 2.4. No, I went over that already. Okay. Anyway, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Going, backing up a little bit to extenders. Yes. Backing up to extenders. Absolutely, but you may have more loss. Maybe the 2.4 gig doesn't get out. I mean, it gets out, but the speed is slow. 
you can uh, end up putting one of those patches <coughs> in to allow you to do that. No, this is you may not be able to change the end. You can also uh -huh. build your own little reflector if you want to and actually aim uh, the AP that's in the recorder and card. You can actually direct the signal as well as going to the internet. More directional. Yeah, you can yeah. do that too. So you can play around with it. You get more directional. Because I did it with my brother's hand cave in his barn out down in Florida. I had a, and get it as high as possible. Get it in the clear as possible. He had his Wi Fi router sitting on the floor of his house. It's like, no wonder you're not getting out very well. So I elevated it and put it in a higher location. You know, just get it as high as possible, in the clear as possible. So that's what you might end up doing. And I'll, I've got a PDF of this, though. I'll be able to send this. Who do I send this to? You? Okay, I'll send this to you, and that way you can put it up and all these references and everything else. So with that, thank you.